Radiobotics is a, an AI startup based out of, of Copenhagen, as, as you mentioned, and we're committed to providing AI solutions for MSK radiology. Tonight, we're going to go through our, our first product, which is Orbi Knee, which is a, a tool to screen for osteoarthritis of the knee. Uh, it's CE cleared and, and recently received MDR certification as a class 2A device. I'm very uh, honored to, to bring our speaker on tonight, which is Professor Michael Boson. And I really think there's nobody else better suited to, to present this case. Uh, Professor Boston is a co-founder of, of RATE, which is a radiological artificial intelligence center in, in Copenhagen. He's also a, an MSK radiologist and a professor at, at Copenhagen University. So welcome, Professor Boston. Uh, thank you very much, Cathal. And uh, thank you for allowing me to present, uh, let's say, the first initial first experience using this uh, a uh, lately approved uh, and see marked uh, product from uh, from radiobotics uh, that are known quite some years now and, and from 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 concept and and seeing them grow has, has been a has been an exciting journey and look forward to to the near future um, following them as well um so so i've been asked to uh, to give uh, let's say some views about how we we read uh, Cases uh, of the knees with osteoarthritis. Uh, some of you might say that they well that that's straightforward and quite easy. Um, yeah, uh, I, I would say that is it's not the 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 most uh, what you can say uh, uh, challenging task. But uh, if you look at the uh, observer variability of grading and quantifying knee osteoarthritis, then then uh, your mindset might need might change because. Because we have uh, very high uh, uh, inter-observer variations uh, uh, classifying the degree of osteoarthritis, and and the RBNE product uh, really can help uh, to standardize this and and do it very robustly. And why is this important? Uh, well, first of all, it's it's as in every other radiological task, it's important to agree as much as possible. Uh, because uh, let's say the degree of a certain disease severity really impacts the patient journey. And you can imagine if, if somebody say it's a mild osteophrytis, another say it's a moderate or even a severe osteophrytis, which there are several examples on in the literature, um, then, uh, then it, it will impact the patient and where the patient is sent uh, to get further treatment. So. So it is really important. We also have some clinical guidelines stating that if you have moderate and severe osteophrytis, then an additional MRI really doesn't help the patients. It can actually even worse the disease because uh, if you do an MRI or even a CT scan of a severely osteophrytic knee, then you see a lot of uh, changes that might have end up having surgery or at least arthroscopic surgery that is not needed. And we have quite good evidence that uh, from, from several RCTs in, in within the late, last 10 years to show that this is actually the case in, 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 uh, that some patients end in that um, area. So having a robust tool that can assist us to classify and grade osteoarthritis uh, and actually gives a much better impact than just solving the specific task of describing what's seen on the image. Having said that, I would like to share my screen and, um, and uh, let's say go through some of the cases that, um, uh, uh, and please let me know if you can see my screen, Cathal. Yes, yes we can. And uh, just, just a note as well, we want to keep this webinar as interactive as possible. So if you do have any questions, uh, please ask them in the chat and I'll, I'll bring them to Professor Boston's attention. Okay, so we are in the landing page here in Collector Minds uh, platform and, and uh, we have uh, six cases. I'm not sure we can go through all of them, but uh, as you will hear uh, very soon, uh, you are uh, after this meeting able to assess them and, and play with them yourself. Um, so uh, what I'll do, I'll, I'll just open the first case here, and um, and then we start with an uh, a knee, an X-ray of both knees. It's you can see it's a standardized knee X-ray because it's it's in a, a standardized position in eight, uh, where you have a thirty degree of flexion and and ten degrees inwards uh, uh, tilting of your toes. Uh, that ensures that when you do the x-rays, 
that you can align the beam. So if you look at the screen here, so you have actually a flat medial tibial plateau. So this is how an X-ray should be should look like of both knees in a standardized research setting. Uh, I know that clinic research and clinic is not always the same, and not everybody can is using the persist positioning device uh, and, and, and let's say it's up to the patient or the, the technicians to acquire the images. But it is important if you want to grade this distance between the bone ends of the medial that you have a medial flat plateau. So having said that, you, you can see if we zoom in that what we look at then, we look at the joint space. Um, here in the medial is actually widened and the reason why it's widened here on the left side is because you have a narrowing on the lateral side. And then you also appreciate that you have these, uh, 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 let's say, bony outgrowth. Uh, they they look like spikes or spurs, bony spurs. They're also described in the English literature, but it's actually a rim of bones uh, because what we're looking at here is a three-dimensional uh, anatomy in a two-dimensional space. So so what is happening when you have osteophytes is that the the bone enlarges and it enlarges along the bone lines. So it's a rim of bones that that actually goes all the way around the bone. And we, we didn't learn that before we actually be, began to do three-dimensional imaging with CT and MR scans uh, 20, 30 years ago. In, in, uh, we, we actually thought there were bony spikes. Um, another thing that is very apparent when you do osteophytes imaging, then you look at the bone and, and normal bone in osteophytes describe that you don't have, uh, uh, let's say, uh, Bone, um, bony washout or, or helisteresis in uh, around the joint line, which you will see when you have uh, inflammatory joint disease. But uh, you have normal bone until you have more severe cases, as in this case, because then you begin to have sclerosis of the bone. And sclerosis is new bone formation, so you have more dense bone. It becomes brighter or whiter on the X-ray along the joint line. So these things are happening in a non-uniform pace. You can have one or the other coming first, but but actually, if you, uh, and, we, and we would like to grade them. So cutting it down to what we are looking at is that we are looking at the joint space. How wide is it? Is it narrowed or is it is it still the same height as, as a normal joint space? Do we have these bony spurs or osteophytes? That, uh, and do we have sclerosis? And in the end, do we have uh, instability or subluxation? So these things is actually something that we can translate into a grading system. And the most widely used, the most recognized is the 1957 developed grading system by Kelgren and Lawrence. And we still use that even for trials. And it's the only FDA approved a classification system for trials to classify the degree of osteophytes, at least the most widely approved. Uh, there's also the uh, the ORC uh, grading scales and, and, and several other grading scales like the ALPIC that I will not have time to go into. But all of them appreciate, let's say, the osteophytes, the joint space narrowing, and the sclerosis. And then you grade them when you're doing Kelgren Lawrence from zero, which is mean normal, to possible osteophytes where you have living of the bone, it's a Kelgren one. If you have it at an osteophyte, which you are certain is an osteophyte, then it's a Kelgren two, and you have potential joint space narrowing. When you then have joint space narrowing um, uh, that, that is uh, apparent, and, and I've defined apparent meaning that you have a, around 50% of the joint space narrowed, then you go to the moderate osteophytes. And the moderate osteophytes is the Kelgren three, and then you have the end state, which is the grade four. Here you have, uh, let's say, near bone on bone or kissing bone, and then you have severe uh, osteophytes and also some cyst formation, which is a phenomenon I, I didn't, uh, let's say, mention uh, in the beginning. And, and in this case, you could see this will correspond to a moderate degree of osteophytes because you are narrowing large osteophytes and also widening of the contralateral joint space on the medial side. Whereas on the right side, you have more like bony spurs that, that are lipping in this in the uh, tibial eminentia and in the medial side and the lateral side. So this is between, according to how you would grade it, between a, a possible osteophyte, meaning Kelgren 1, and a 
and a, and a, and a Kelgren 2, which is uh, uh, slight osteophytes. And that varies between observers. Let's see how we're doing when you when you then use the, the radiobotic algorithm. Um, because they take all of these things into account. And here you can actually see that you have the, the arrows points at here, the yellow arrows points as the osteophytes, the 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 stipple the, the, this um, uh, let's say tur turquoise line on let's say outline the sclerosis and and also the yellow or uh, say purple bars here they are the uh, joint space and they're measured when you have a joint space narrowing and how do you then do radiobotics me measure joint space narrowing they're measuring according to the URC grade that has three components or in some cases four components, but at least it has joint space narrowing, sclerosis and osteophytes, which they grade separately, not like in the kirkland lorentz scale, where you grade everything into one grade. Um, so, so you have here a secondary capture and that really helps the observer to outline what you need experience to see on the gray and white scale image. So you are helped here, depending on how experienced you are, You Everybody can see this, even the patient, and that that is you, you don't underestimate the the power of the communication tool with an AI and a secondary capture when you are let's say communicating with the patient and also communicating from radiologists to clinicians and between clinicians. If you have something with a secondary capture on, it's much easier to agree on what you see than just wording it. Uh, or writing it even in a report because that opens up possibilities to interpretations. And, and all of these features here, you can see with tibial eminentia osteophytes, osteophytes on the medial and lateral side, and osteophytes here on the left side on the medial and lateral and medial side, and sclerosis and joint space narrowing. That really gives you um, the components to do what radiobotics also provide is the report. And the report comes, let's say, in the language uh, right now in, 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 the, in the English language as well as in the, uh, uh, in, in, in the Danish language. And it says it with the conclusion, right knee, mild tibiofemoral osteophytes. That was corresponding to the KL2 that I mentioned, uh, because you have defined osteophytes on both medial and lateral side and the tibial eminentia, and also have some sclerosis. Uh, and on the left side, you have severe uh, tibiofemoral osteophytes because you have severe joint space narrowing. And, and that corresponds to a, a, a large grade three or even a grade four. Um, so it really helps you and it can standardize it. And the beauty about this system is that uh, experts, they agree with each other's between eight out of 10 and nine out of 10 times, um, whereas this, algorithm, they ag agree with itself 10 out of 10 times. So uh, so, so th this is really an, an important feature and, and we have tested it. Uh, it's developed on the OAI data set, uh, uh, validated on the most data set, and then uh, we tested it in the Danish uh, cohort data set and we found an accuracy towards uh, two expert readers and two junior readers and some reading technicians. Uh, with the expert readers, we have an accuracy of uh, uh, above 99% uh, of agreement. So, so it really aligns with what we see uh, these reports. Okay, um, so that was an easy one. Um, if you know what to look for, uh, then we are, let's say, stepping up a little bit and then um, uh, taking the next case. And the next case here, you will be able to see Um, that you have some knees here where you have, let's say, quite smooth joints spaces. Uh, you don't have a, a, a flat tibial plateau. Uh, and that is also what we see, even though you use a positioning device, you see on the right side, the tibial plateau is not flat. It's more flat on the left side. And this is just normal anatomic variations. You cannot always appreciate this flat tip. So even how much you tilt with your beam angle. Um, but again, 
Okay, we have a report here uh, on the right hand side where you see there's no astrophytes, no joint space narrowing on the right side, so it's classified as normal. But on the left side, you'll see that you have some joint space narrowing. It's a little bit, it's beginning. And why do we have that, even though we don't have secondary osteophytic features? Well, this is because 50% of the joint space is due to the meniscus. And the meniscus you can't see on the, on the plain x-ray. Um, so if you have meniscal bulking or meniscus extrusion, either due to a previous trauma or just because of laxity of, of uh, increasing age, then you will have a joint space narrowing. And this, is, this, this can be measured and is captured here by, by, the, uh, by, the, um, uh, by the software and also comes into the report that then states that we don't have any osteophytes. But if you go down to, let's say, how we describe it, you'll see that on the left side, you have some joint space narrowing in the medial compartment. Uh, and that really helps you to, let's say, if, to, to classify the knee. It's not osteophytes, but it has some joint space changes. And, and this is where it becomes difficult because, uh, and, and where controversies come in interpretation because what drives your, your uh, diagnosis of osteophytes is not really clear cut defined that if you have joint space narrowing, some would say it's osteophytes because that's how we learn it or remember it. Others would say it's not because you need both sclerosis and or an osteophytes, or uh, if you don't have any osteophytes, you can't have osteophytes. And, and all of them are to some extent right in their own, in their own conscience due to the fact that, that we actually, um, I can hear somebody's microphone is, um, so, so we, we have learned when we do M MRI of knees where we actually think they have no osteophytes, that a lot of them have some features of osteophytes, but we just can't see it yet on the, on the x-rays. And, and this would be such, probably could be such a case on, on the left side. So, so you, could, you could have some minute changes of cartilage fibrillations, of, uh, of uh, synovitis and, and effusion in, or, or municipal damage um, that you just do, doesn't appreciate in, in, the, in the left knee. And, and another feature you also like to appreciate is that you will see here in the tibial eminentia, you're beginning to see some, some uh, spikes of the tibial eminentia there that is not as apparent on the other side. And, and we don't know yet what that means in terms of classifying osteophytes in the community, but we are, let's say, beginning to dissect that this probably could be due to the fact that you are looking at only the medial and lateral joint space and not the patellofemoral joint space, which would need a, a, a lateral X-ray, as I show you here. And that lateral X-ray also look normal because you don't have any lipping yet. So, so this is a case where you can where you can appreciate that. Okay, going to the next case. Uh, let me see. Um, Just while you're opening up this case, Professor Bosom, yeah. we have a, a question in the chat around osteochondritis. Yeah, uh, dissecants. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, this is definitely a differential diagnosis of osteophritis, and we know that it can it can speed up the um, uh, so so it, depending on on, on the which is, whether it's tra traumatic or if it's an, an insufficient fracture. Um, so osteochondritis this you can say that it, it's it's a traumatic in, entity where where <clears throat> where you uh, uh, let's say have a cartilage lesion. And we know that when you have a trauma to the cartilage, you speed up your your uh, development of secondary osteophytes due to the impact. It's it's widely known after an ACL injury uh, or anterior cruciate ligament injury or or a, a medial collateral ligament uh, 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 injury that that uh, can uh, also be seen with ACL injuries, and that speeds up. But the software doesn't yet classify the the, the clear-cut uh, osteochondritis dissecants. 
but it classifies the secondary osteoarthritis due to that. And, and this is definitely on the development step of this software in the pipeline that that the vision of all of radio budget, and correct me if I'm wrong, citing your goals, is that uh, you aim within the next few years to actually develop an algorithm that can handle all, all knee-related cases on the x-rays. But we start with the most prominent and most widely, uh, let's say, uh, uh, the, 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 um, the most widely seen pathology on the knee x-rays, and that's osteoarthritis. And, and some of you might also think that osteoarthritis is something that we just get in old age and we live with and then die with. But the fact is that WHO and FDA recently, uh, within the last two years, have approved osteoarthritis as being the fifth severe disease in the world. And the reason for that is because osteoarthritis doesn't come not only with the changes in the joint, but it actually comes with secondary inactivity and pain and severe pain, and it impacts your life quality, it impacts the pension uh, refunds, and it also then increases the obesity, the cardiovascular disease, and by that you die approximately five to 10 years prior having osteoarthritis than people with same age without osteoarthritis. So it is a severe disease, uh, in the same level as cardiovascular disease, as cancer and psychiatric diseases. So we need to take this seriously. And this is why we need also tools that can classify it correctly because our tools to treat are limited, but they work if you do it in the proper pace where it, so, so in the mild cases, it's weight loss and exercise and then pain medication and pain coping. Whereas in the moderate and severe cases, you can end up with a replacement of the knees. And then you might say that, why don't we just replace all the knees then? Because then the problem is gone. First of all, we have half a billion and more people in the world that suffer with this. So it would be a very huge and very expensive task. But we also know that 20% of all knee replacement cases, they end up not solving the pain problem. So we really need to take care and save the surgery for the end stage. And for those who have tried everything else before, because it doesn't solve necessarily your problem, just going to the surgeon. And this tool can help us to stratify this, to assist the patient journey in it because it's digital. It can be applied everywhere, even where you don't have radiological expertise. And then it can provide the same high level of expertise as you would see in a university setting where you have all the experts. So it really is a tool for the many and for everybody giving equal healthcare rights to everybody in this domain. Even though you might say it's a simple task that we solve, it actually can help a lot, a lot of people. So, so this is just my comment for that. Okay, another case where we see here is that where we don't really appreciate osteoarthritis, but we we see that you are beginning to see some widening of the end plate, especially here uh, and there and over here. And this is also depicted on the uh, radiobotic tool. So we don't have any osteoarthritis yet, but we have some sclerosis. And again, that can confuse the inexperienced readers to think that this is a mild case of osteoarthritis but it really isn't. Um, any questions while I open up the next case, Cathal? Yes, yeah, we have a great question just come in from Adam. So how do you distinguish between osteochondritis and osteochondral lesion, example, in the talus? Oh, in the talus, uh, yeah. Um, with, first of all, it's not the scope of today's talk, uh, but, but but the, the, uh, the, you, need, you need to look at the history. Um, and then uh, uh, usually the osteochondral lesion that comes due to a trauma. Osteochondritis, this can, it, can, it can happen for many reasons uh, that are not necessarily trauma-induced. But, but they look more or less the same on the X-ray. And then the osteochondrit, the, the, the traumatic ones, they tend to be on this 
on the medial and lateral side where you've had your impact, your trauma. Um, so, uh, uh, but it, but it's a, it's it's a much larger story that I don't have time to to dig into any further uh, because it's out of scope of this topic. If we need to, within the time limit, to uh, to go through all the cases here. Um, so. Um, we have here another case where you also see that that you appreciate that you have some very smooth contours on the medial and lateral side of the of the knee X-ray. But if you take the lateral radiograph, um, then you are able to see that. Uh, sorry, here uh, I think this is better. Um, you're able to see that on the patella, you have uh, let's say lipping and and a bony spur here on the on the anterior pole of the patella, and you also, if you let's say, change a little bit the color and I let me see here the window setting. Um, let me see there. Um, you see that you also have this dark light gray change here in front of this light gray structure. This is the tendon of the quadriceps, but this light gray um, uh, change just behind it, it's actually a small fluid sample in this suprapatella uh, pouch. But but this change here is simply due to patella, beginning of patellofemoral arthritis. And it is depicted on the software. You see that you have arrows pointing at when you have, you, when you have uh, let's say spurring or osteophytes on the proximal and the distal poles of the patella. And, and I know that some might say that this is not where we would grade or see osteophytes of the patella because we need a skyline or a shoes view to do that. But you can easily depict the changes here and get the idea that you need to think about patellofemoral osteophytes when patient comes with pain. And we know from MRI studies that 70% of cases in some of the cohorts out there that are, don't have any osteophytes in the medial and lateral joint space, they actually have changes in the patellofemoral joint when you do MRI as the reference. So, so it is an under, um, let's say, uh, diagnosed uh, uh, cause of knee pain, the patellofemoral osteophytes. We don't really know how, know how to tackle it yet because all of the trials that we're doing are using only the posterior anterior view, where, where we only see the medial and lateral joint space view. But we, in the clinical setting, at least in Nordic countries and in many other places in the world, we also have in the clinical setting a lateral. A true lateral would be where the condyles are overlapping, and and you can see they are definitely not here. So we have some uh, some some angle uh, difficulties here. But it doesn't change the fact that we can see the patellofemoral joints osteophytes. Um, so, uh, so that is underdiagnosed, and in a lot of places in the, the U.S. I've learned they don't even have the lateral as part of the clinical routine. So it's it's you don't even see it, uh, and which I think is a pity because it can explain a lot of why the patient comes, and and there's nothing more disappointing for a patient to go. To an examination and then get then get the report back and says there's nothing that explains my pain, so you have pain for no reason, uh, and and this could also be one of the reasons why it's, we we don't always, let's say, uh, can correlate the patient's symptoms with what we see in the images because we do not doing the proper images to reflect that, uh, but that's a very long discussion that uh, that uh, we need to take at another time point. Um, okay, um, that was the uh, that case. Next case is you would probably say, okay, we have also a lot of cases where, where for instance, um, uh, we have an uh, uh, previous surgery, um, and and here we have, uh, and and how do does the software perform with that? Because that's important uh, that the software doesn't see a surgery as some art grade of osteophytes because that wouldn't make sense. Um, and, uh, and as you can see here, it doesn't classify it. So it comes with an error message. Um, 
and 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 that's that's actually also important. We don't have any arthritis in the medial lateral joint uh, spaces, but we have some narrowing, which also is reflected here on the measurements. And it's um, the way I use and and let's say use these measurements to to say when is it slightly narrowed, when it's moderately narrowed, when it's really severely narrowed. There are some cutouts in the literature saying below two millimeters, that's uh, that's severely narrowed, and above to two to four millimeters, then it's moderate, and then. But remember, we have different heights as well, and if we don't, uh, and that will also give us different joint spaces. So some have a, a normal joint space of six millimeters, some has four millimeters. Uh, so so you can't really use this mean to to be a patient specific one. Um, but then it's good that we usually have two knees if you don't have a, a, an arthroplasty in the other knee to actually assist us in, in this, this case where, where we can um, uh, uh, see how does the other knees look like. So it's the reference to that that we interpret it. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, the, if you look at these colors, the bars are more or less even. And when they are more or less even, it's only slightly narrowed. When the more lateral uh, bar here begins to look like a triangle, then this is where I begin to say now it's moderately narrowed. And when all of them are very flat below two millimeters, then I would say it's severely narrow. So this is my, let's say, interpretations of the rules out there um, of how I use it. And it's also reflected in the report um, where it's, it states that that you um, you you have no arthritis on the left side and the left knee doesn't is not described because it's an arrow message as you can see uh, <clears throat> arrow message in the left knee. Please contact the support team. So this is where the product is now. I know that a robotic is working also classifying the different art the different. The, the different uh, arthroplasties and and the, this is a product that comes later uh, in uh, down in the, in the pipeline. And finally, um, we can go to the last case where um, let me see here where you see you have severely kissing bone, bone on bone, and Severely sclerosis and also remodeling of that of that uh, bony plate it becomes flat and enlarged. On the other on the other side it's it's uh, there's no um, uh, osteoarthritis but some sclerosis around the medial part and this is also beautifully reflected here with the secondary capture the osteophytes no joint space as you can see here so it's not classified basically uh, the, the, uh, this kissing bone and severe sclerosis. And, and that comes also down into the report where it states that you have severe tibial femoral arthritis on the right side and no tibial femoral arthritis on the left side. But you have some, uh, let's say, subchondral sclerosis. I think that was the six cases that I we could within 40 minutes go through. Uh, they call obviously knee arthritis comes in all sizes, shapes, and variations. But I hope you got get an idea that that how I interpret it, having seen uh, thousands of these throughout my last 20 years of working with this, uh, is actually uh, the the radiobotic software is doing a really pretty good job to mimic that and assisting us in also <clears throat> in a digital path to make this conclusion. And we are now working on utilizing that to actually assist us in, in workflow optimizations and also prediction uh, as well as a recommendation for, for further uh, treatment according to the national guidelines. So uh, in a popular term, putting uh, electricity to the national gu guideline instead of uh, uh, being a manual interpretation hack as as many uses still, even in 2021. Oh, thanks, Professor Boson. And actually, there's a question coming in around that, which I think uh, speaks really nicely to it. So could the software be used to alert the radiographer when there is end-stage OA 
and allow them to inform and refer the patient directly on for treatment. So could we speed yeah. up the patient pathway here? Definitely, definitely. And and but but I, I my recommendation is that that say even though it sounds easy, uh, it's it's changing workflow optimization is quite a, a, a let's say a difficult task because there's so many ingrown ways of working with things. But we need to because we have now the technology and it is digital, we need to begin to rethink our referral pathways. And what we're using it for is two things in Denmark, because we have a democratic healthcare system where, where if you overspend on diagnostic images or on treatments in one part of the, of, of the healthcare system, it will impact that we have lesser money in the other part of the healthcare system, because we have one pile of money that has to pay for everything. And we paid over our taxes uh, that some might say is high, but then we get everything healthcare for free along the schools and some. So, so this is how we have uh, are doing in Denmark. And, and obviously here, we, we are also looking at uh, pre premature referrals to orthopedic surgeons, surgeons in some places in Denmark, uh, they, they have to send home. 40% of all the patients, first time they're sent to the orthopedic surgeon outpatient clinic with an, without a treatment plan uh, or, or, or without a surgical treatment plan because the patient really comes too early. So this is definitely to answer the questions in a short term. Yes, we can optimize that because if we make the radiographer make the image, we send the image to the DICOM node that that reads this 30 seconds later, you have the report along with the secondary capture in the system. And then you can use that to alert either the radiographer or the secretary, even the patient, that this is the case. You have moderate severe or not severe uh, arthritis. And then next step would be go down, go follow the red line to the orthopedic outpatient clinic or uh, go home to your GP that has a plan or go to the physio or go to to the weight loss consultant uh, at three doors down, because then they, they have a plan for you because uh, you need to lose weight if you are obese. And all of these we can optimize. And, and we don't really need to involve the radiologists at that time point. Radiologists still have to be in the back end or the reading radiographer, but they can come in the second wave and quality control the findings as well as as a, a let's say, a describing potential secondary uh, features that the software hasn't yet depicted, like osteochondritis desiccans, CPPD, enchondromas, uh, stuff like that. Uh, that I know is on your bucket list, and 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 you're working on solving with technology, but and which with the product will be enhanced with further on. But but still, uh, we can really use this now, this tool to optimize that, and. And another way we will have, we use this tool is that because we in Denmark, as everywhere else in the in the West, in developed world, we are overusing MRI scans in this patient population when you have modern severe osteophytes. The recommendation even state that you shouldn't have an MRI because it doesn't it doesn't give you any added value. It just gives you more worries because you see more pathology and you can end up having a house cleaning with a troscopy that we know doesn't work from large RCTs that have been published in the five big uh, medical journals, Lancet, New England Journal of Medicine and, 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 uh, and, and so on. So all of that can help us. And, and, and we have seen a 30 to 40% increase in MRI scans as in, in, in developed world in, in the States as well. Um, where, where the MRI comes even before the X-ray, uh, and and uh, and we can save that expense actually, if if we rely on the X-ray because the X-ray tells the whole story here uh, re regarding this specific feature. Um, it's another thing if you have a locked knee, if you have a swollen knee, if you have an inflamed knee, then you obviously need an MRI to uh, rule out some of the differentials like infections, inflammatory joint diseases, and a, and a, a loose body that is, a, a, let's say, intertwined and, and, and that needs to be picked out. So, so I'm not saying we don't need the surgeons. I'm just saying that we send too many patients to the surgeons that is not necessary. And we're trying to solve that with optimization around the tool here. 
and, and our expectation is as and preliminary results shows us we can save between five and 30% of MRI scans without really impacting the patient journey or the treatment. Um, and and that is, that is uh, actually also worth some millions a year. No, that's that a, we then can reinvest in buying the software or, or or doing treatment that is not reimbursed today. No, thanks for that, Professor Boson. Uh, maybe we can end on on this last question, and and I think I I know what you're going to say to this one. So, uh, the question here is from from Adam: Should a patello projection be standard in X-ray of the knee to uh, diagnose osteoarthritis? Oh, you would the 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 skyline view, you mean, or the uh, the lateral? So don't have uh, that context. If you want, Adam, feel free to unmute yourself and, and uh, confirm. Skyline, he says. Yeah, okay. The, no, I don't think, I, I don't think this, we need the skyline. Um, so the skyline shouldn't be uh, a standard. The lateral can give us a clue because what we can, and if I can take up a case, what we also can learn from the lateral is that the, um, is that uh, we have a, a, a clearly underdiagnosed patellofemoral dysplasia. Um, uh, and, and this is an inborn thing similar to dysplasia in the hip. But, uh, but what, what we will see on the lateral, as you can see here, you have, uh, let's say, it's, it's almost perfect. It's not completely, but you have, uh, let's say, overlapping condyles here, so they are aligned. But what we need to see here on the lateral, and not only look in the, the patella, um, is that that if you have a crossing sign, meaning that the the, uh, the boundary or, or the the lowest point of the trochlea of the femur crosses the uh, lateral part of the uh, femoral condyle, then you have a crossing sign where this line crosses that line, and 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 it's called the Schur's classification. It comes with an A, B, C, and D, um, and when you have that you have to have a suspicion of patellofemoral dysplasia, and then you need the skyline, or even better, a cone beam CT scan or a CT scan or an MRI, because they are, it's in 3D where you can then begin to measure some other uh, things that, that are, comes with this dysplasia, like the uh, increased uh, uh, TGT distance, uh, the uh, insol salvati index, uh, patella alta, and all of that. Um, so all of these measures you can measure on the X-ray, but also on the three-dimensional scans. But the X-ray should give us a clue. That's the entrance uh, port because we we have the patients. We are seeing them in the in the outpatient clinics, in the emergency rooms, and and here we should find all of also the differentials. Perfect. Uh, I hope that answered the question. Thank you very much indeed to uh, to you, Professor Busan, uh, to all the participants. Really, really great questions. Uh, Radiobotics, I mean, super impressive to see how this works. Uh, really, really happy to have uh, have a partnership with us. So the users from Collective Minds can actually test the Radiobotic solution. And uh, I see today we have uh, several of our users on the call from, from Germany, from Wales, from the UK. Uh, so really, really happy to uh, to have had this webinar and the opportunity to present to uh, I mean to the radiology and the reporting radiographer community. Uh, just a final remark to uh, I mean invite you all to participate and to test this out. Um, actually, we have. A Let's see. Katal, can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. yes okay. Can. Super. So. Uh, to get started and to test this out, uh, for those of you who have a user account on Collective Minds, you can actually uh, log in and you will see an instruction at the top of the page visible from, uh, from since a few minutes ago. Um, for those of you who do not have an account at Collective Minds, just go to simrad.com and register. This is free uh, and exclusively for, for doctors as well as reporting radiographers. Um, and uh, we will ask you if you want to be a part of this and to test out the AI to either comment uh, some of Professor Boson's lecture cases that will be made available uh, and or to upload your own case to request an analysis. Um, so we hope that this will stimulate to a further discussion also after this webinar. And uh, 
if you have any questions, I mean, just drop us an email on support at uh, And uh, I mean, from the Collective Minds team and here in the Stockholm office, thank you again, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Kathal, for hosting. Thank you, Professor Boson, for an excellent lecture. And I wish you all a good evening. Appreciate it. Yeah, you too. Thank you thank for you being able to do this. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye. Take care. Thank you.